Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Resuming Debate. I'm your host, Member of Parliament, Garnet Jenis. Uh, we just had the federal budget this past Thursday, and uh, lots of things uh, in the budget we could we could discuss. I think uh, um, for, for those who, who follow the mechanics of the legislative process less, it's good, it, it's good to know that uh, from a policy perspective, uh, the budget day is one of the most important days of the year. It's when we, we actually see uh, not just the overall uh, fiscal plan, but, but all kinds of uh, announcements on various detailed aspects of the government's agenda that, uh, that all pass together. So, so that was last Thursday, and um, we are going to uh, dig into today one uh, announcement that was in the budget on page 195 uh, about changes in some regulations impacting the charitable sector. Uh, and it's one of those things that doesn't, doesn't uh, necessarily make the top line news in the midst of all the other things that are happening uh, in the budget, uh, but it is a really big deal for the Canadian charitable sector. And, and there's also uh, a lot more to be seen. You have a, the budget as an aspirational document, which sets out some aspirations and, and, and general intentions, uh, but it, it takes some time before the details roll out. So sometimes it, you like where it seems to be going and then it doesn't end up going that way or 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 vice versa. Uh, but to to join me to discuss the, this particular issue in terms of the charitable sector, but also to give you an inside look at the role the Senate plays in our, our policy making process, I'm very pleased to be joined uh, by Senator Ratna Omitvar, uh, a senator from Ontario uh, and uh, one of the first senators appointed by uh, Prime Minister Trudeau as part of this uh, uh, this effort to um, uh, to create a, a Senate that uh, that is facially more independent. Has, has, that approach has some critics from those that, that wonder about about that. But it's uh, uh, Senator Omidfar, uh right now. You were you were one of the first. Thank you so much for joining the podcast, and I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I'm looking forward to it too, Garnett. And I, I think the budget announcements, as you said, are aspirational. Uh, but what is really important for Canadians to understand is that the charitable sector is a big slice of our society. It employs it, it, it employs 2 million people. It contributes 8% to the GDP. So just as we paid attention to the housing announcement, I'm delighted that people are also paying attention to the sector. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I wanted to start by talking about kind of the role of the Senate and your 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 work as a as a senator since you've you've been appointed. Uh, but maybe I'll just before we go into that, I'll just pick up on your comment about the the charitable sector. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. We, we we all we all know and interact with charities in, in some way in our lives. Many people work in the charitable sector. Um, it, at the same time, it seems to me that government sometimes struggles to interact with. With the charitable sector, we don't have. I mean, we have a minister responsible for housing. We have a minister responsible for for tourism. We don't really have a minister responsible for the charitable sector. Um, so, um, so, so, what do you what do you think about kind of the collaboration that's required between government and the charitable sector, and and where some of the missing pieces are? The sector, you know, because it's so diverse. You know, it 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 there there are religious charities there are cultural charities there are environmental charities there are you know human rights charities and all of them relate to the government in a in a horizontal way sort of sort of you know department to department so a cultural charity will will have conversations with Canadian heritage and a human rights organization may have uh, interactions with uh, Global Affairs Canada, for instance, but there is no one place. There is no one place or department or minister that brings all of these together. So the, the, the common interest of charities, uh, regardless of their mission, you know, uh, challenges such as technology, such as, uh, you know, moving into the digital age, such as, you know, the, the, the lack of, uh, of, of talent, the sector also faces. So there's no one place where it comes together. And buried in the Senate Charities Report was a very important recommendation that the government actually create a home for the sector in government with an 
assistant deputy minister with a budget. Now, we've had ministers of charities or something like that before, but it's been a political move and which has been instituted and then very quickly done away with. So I think the sector needs something more permanent, more structural inside government so that they can have all these conversations. But that is still an aspiration that we have to all deliver on, at least I've sort of mm-hmm. made it part of my mission to deliver on that one as well. Mm-hmm. So you, you've you uh, chosen to be a real champion of the charitable sector in the Senate. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about your, your background prior to becoming a senator and um, and uh, how, how you became a senator and, and how that uh, kind of contributed to your sense of mission around this, uh, this work for the charitable sector. Yeah, you know, so much of it, this is personal. Uh, the first job I ever got in Canada, the first real job I ever got in Canada as an immigrant in 1981 was with a local charitable organization. They didn't ask me if I had Canadian work experience. You, you remember, this is 1981. That was the discourse of the day. Mm-hmm. And they trusted me with, uh, with, with a challenge, which, uh, you know, which I embraced and, and delivered on. And ever since then, I have only actually worked in charitable organizations. I've sat on boards of charities. I've run charities. I've run a private foundation. I've uh, worked at a research uh, think tank in a university. So the the civil society sector charities um, is, is a very big part of my life. And I think it's partly because of that life that I became, that I, I, I caught the interest of or the attention of whoever it was at that time who was who was appointing the first six independent senators. It was my work on uh, on poverty reduction, on immigration, on uh, the sector itself. I think that was uh, the reason I was appointed. Mm-hmm. So, so what was the process like for for appointments? Because it, I mean, his, historically, generally, it's been. I'm not always, but often people with uh, with those personal relationships or party connections. Uh, did you have um, did you have personal relationships, or, or was it? Did, and did you? But they, I think they they also was part of the new process. They put out some kind of application process. So did you fill out an application, or did somebody else kind of reach out to you and say, "Hey, we'd like to have you do this"? Uh, it it was the latter. It was the okay. first process, so it was you know, the the people who were responsible for putting forward the state of candidates reached out to me. And, and, and at first I said, no, I'm, this is not for me. Uh, and then they reached out a second time and I said, no, this is not for me. And the third time they reached out, I, I had a, a think about it. And I said, okay, well, let's put my name in the hat and see what happens. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that I would actually get a call from the prime minister. Never in my wildest dreams. The process has now changed significantly. Uh, It's no longer, you know, at that first stage, it's now people apply. Uh, When there are vacancies, a selection panel is struck and they make their uh, recommendations. And we are hoping to get a whole slate of new senators appointed soon because there are many vacancies. But, you know, I I, I will have to, I, I will tell you when I joined the Senate, I had, I, I, had be, I have been an advocate and an activist all my life. And it's very different when you're working from the outside mm-hmm. and completely different when you're working on the inside. And the systems and the rules and the procedures and the relationships, all of this play into it. And that was a huge learning curve for me. Mm-hmm. I'd imagine that one of the things that would have changed dramatically for you is there are there are perceptions about different professions, right? People think if you're, if you're a doctor, you're a trust trustworthy. And if you're a journalist, you're not. And, you know, so and you, you kind of um, went from, from the high end to the low end in terms of, of public perception, especially in 2016 at the, at the time. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so people's uh, and, and uh, I think there may have been, been further shifts since, but um, you know, if you're, you're, you're uh, on the boards working at charitable sector, p- people, I'm sure that, the general response you got at dinner parties was that's that's great work you're you're making a difference you know thank you and and uh, and then all of a sudden you're a senator so how what, what was that like and um and how how did you how did you find that sort of social reaction to people hearing that you were a senator and and uh, you know maybe, maybe making assumptions about you that were different than the assumptions they used to make yeah that that was frankly 
a bit of a challenge. Uh, but the bigger challenge really was that wrapped into all of this about the reputation of the Senate was a lack was a lack of understanding by Canadians on what the role of the Senate is. And you know, trying to explain uh, uh, to people who who whose level of let's say civic literacy is is not as high as it should be, and it should be higher. I think we all agree with that. Um, to explain to them that the Senate is the house of sober second thought, that no legislation can get passed, nothing can become law without us putting our, our eyes on it. And we do it in this way with this lens because we're not the elected government. We don't have to go and run for election garden like you do. We And so there's this perception of A, you know, you, you don't do anything. B, you cost the government a huge amount of money. And three, uh, so many of you are, are corrupt. So that was really hard. But I think uh, over time, uh, in the last uh, six to seven years that I've been a senator, we have shown our mettle in a way as, as, a, as a house of debate, of, of, of uh, non, I mean, the independence at least, nonpartisan debate about issues and, and furthered um, uh, uh, legislation, improved it when it needed to be approved, but always mindful of the fact, Garnet, and I'm, I'm particularly mindful of it. Nobody elected me. You know, I, th there, there are uh, certain limits to what I, I, I can do, rightfully so. But one of the benefits of being a senator is that you can introduce private legislation, what we would call a Senate public bill. And, and that bill is here is what we're here to talk about charities etc mm -hmm. yeah no that's that's um those are those are really really interesting points and um uh, I, and after this question we'll, we'll go on to talking specifically about the the charities issues i, I do want to ask one, one more question just about sort of critiques of the senate so there's there's one critique that, that you mentioned which is i i think a less informed one people say that you know the senate doesn't do anything right they, they think yeah. the senate the senate does does nothing right um and and that's that's clearly not true the senate has a lot of power in our system and i i know i know senators or at least at least many senators work very hard another kind of critique would be that the senate does too much uh that it um that it exercises too much power uh as a as an unelected institution um i, I know that i i've found that on certain issues uh, individual senators actually exercise more power than individual MPs. Uh, the government needs the votes of individual senators to get legislation through the Senate. Um, you know, in the House of Commons, uh, they care less about my opinion because they kind of just expect the, the parties to line up as as, as parties. Um, and so, so maybe that's an argument for the House of Commons <laughs> changing. Um, but, um, but I mean, on, on issues like um, um, the the Emergencies Act, uh, where um, it never came to a vote in the Senate, but but ultimately it it was it was a party line vote in the in the House, but in the Senate there was there was more risk that the government's uh, what the government wanted wouldn't go through. The um, on the on the issue of euthanasia or medical assistance in dying, the Senate of course made a very consequential amendment uh, to bring in um, uh, to bring in. Uh, euthanasia for for those where the the, the sole complaint is 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 mental health mental related health, and yeah yeah and, and and i i strongly oppose that as my as my listeners listeners will know and we don't need to go into this particulars of that discussion but it, it does raise a question of um you know so 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 some of the time the public is unaware of the senate but then at other times you see this incredibly consequential role being played by by senators and um and maybe that creates a, a different set of, of problems and challenges what's, what's your response to those who might say is the Senate on some of these issues doing doing too much? Well, what what Canadians have today is a Senate where opinions are far more uh, 
nuanced uh, in, in the sense that we weigh in on the substance as opposed to on the political ideology. Uh, there was initially, uh, you know, there was this, this rumor out there that this, the new independent senators are, are liberals in hiding. I think we have proven that is not the case. Uh, we can get quite muscular on certain issues where we feel improvements need to be made. It is always up to the House of Commons to reject uh, proposals that we make. And, and it has rejected many proposals. I'm remembering the, the mega environmental act where we had close yeah. to, I think, a hundred amendments, and a lot of them were actually clean up of the act itself, which the government agreed on, but a lot of them were accepted and a lot of them were not accepted. It is the government's right yeah. not to accept. And, and there is, you know, in my head at least, a working rule. And it is this, uh, and I, I'll say that again, I am not the elected people. And, and therefore there are limits to how far I will go, unless it's an egregious breach of, you know, let's say, you know, our constitution or, or rights of minorities, that's within our, our mandate, in fact, to make sure that laws that are put forward, we take a second look through, uh, through them to ensure that the rights of minorities are not impinged, regions are protected, mm -hmm. uh, constitution, etc. But, you know, I think, uh, uh, putting some, uh, some reasonable, um, uh, uh, I'm not gonna use the word limits, I, some reasonable expectations mm -hmm. of what I am, am as a senator or we as a Senate are able to do is really important. We are not uh, the, the first house, you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, th thank you. I think, I think that'll be some really good perspective for people understanding um, this. this the Senate and how how uh, senators uh, conceive of their role. Um, I, I think one of the points you made about Senate public bills putting private members bills forward just just highlights um, the the important uh, power that comes with being able to put an item on the agenda. And this is just really one of the most important powers that both senators and members of Parliament have is we can't individually compel um, compelled that our, our position goes forward, but uh, we can work to put something on the agenda that otherwise just wouldn't be be talked about. And you've done that with respect to the issue of direction and control. You've taken an issue that people are talking about in the charitable sector, and you have forced it onto the political agenda uh, with, with significant effect. Um, for, for those that aren't connected to the sector um because you just kind of give the the kind of direction and control for dummies like what what is um, uh what what is it that's a very good question because it is rather technical and and let me let me try and put it this way there is a a, a section in the income tax act that states that charities can own can only disperse their charitable dollars in one of two ways. They can conduct their own activities or they can grant further to another charitable organization, which is what foundations normally do. But there are times, uh, and, and so the act confirms quite particularly that charitable dollars can only be spent on your own charitable activities. But there are times, Garnet, when a charity must work with another organization a movement, an entity that is not a charity for a very good reason, but they need to work with that entity to advance their charitable mission. So let me just give you an example. Examples are what bring this alive. When the YMCA, for instance, or the YWCA, which, whose mandate is to promote uh, the well-being of women, wants to, you know, let's say, work with Afghani women in improving their financial literacy. Then they're best off to work with the local Afghan women's group, which is not a charity. And, and because they are not a charity, the law stipulates that the YWCA, when it engages in partnership with the local Afghan group, that they actually own the activities of that group. And they do that by exercising direction and control. And direction and control means, uh, you know, participating, as, as lawyers have said, participating in a legal process that is extremely onerous, extremely administrative, uh, uh, heavy, uh, 
that lots and lots of boxes and forms and papers have to be ticked off, in effect, sapping the energy of both partners and a lot of the finances in order to prove uh, that one organization owns the activities of the others. And in doing so, they also own the voice of the non-charity. No press releases can be issued by the non-charity. All public relations material belongs to the charity. At times in the past, uh, you know, uh, receipts have to be, and, and all of this is not bad. It, the accountability is important because charitable dollars, you know, need to be trusted. We need to trust that charitable dollars are being spent for charitable purpose. So there are all these systems in place, but what the system does is it, in, it, it prevents uh, organizations on the margin, such as indigenous groups and BIPOC charities from participating in the philanthropic space because the burden of proof, the burden of administration is too much for them. It's too much for the charity and there's too much risk involved. I know of foundations who have said to me, I would so like to work with indigenous organizations, but I dare not because technically I'm supposed to direct and control them. And everyone knows what those two words mean to an indigenous organization. Mm -hmm. So people step back, they're risk averse, they don't want to do it. So it's a simple change. Simple change is required. Remove those two words from the legislation, own activities, replace them with other words that assure accountability, and let's move on. Just as our partners in the United States have moved on, they don't have this archaic rule. Our partners in Australia have moved on, and so on and so forth. We are stuck in Elizabethan times, and this is part of the problem. The charitable sector has never really been paid attention to by the government, not never really. And, and so there is pent up demand for changes in legislation uh, that are now, I think, finally getting some light of day. Mm -hmm. So and, and you kind of mentioned them together, but maybe just to, to pull them out. I mean, what, one issue is the administrative burden, right? Mm -hmm. that, that this is just requiring mm -hmm. uh, a whole bunch of, of, of paperwork be done by by charities. But the other issue is um it's a it's it's less of a technical and more of a substantive issue right it's it's the the way that control denies autonomy yes. uh and how uh if um you know if, if you've got a a large charitable organization that wants to work with kind of a, a grassroots organization that still is doing charitable work but doesn't have charitable certification and that is community-based in a um uh, perhaps in a in an indigenous community in a in a um you know, in a, in, a, in a marginalized community somewhere, somewhere else, um, somewhere around the world, that basically that charitable organization has to say, okay, uh, we want to work with you and support you, but we are going to retain full control. Um, and that really is the opposite of, of the best practice in that situation, which, are, which, which you should be wanting to do in that situation is, is uh, empowerment. It's recognizing that it's, it's the community themselves that are the hero of their own story. And, and the external charitable foundation is sort of just playing a background role supporting that work, but instead direction and control, it, 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 it requires the perpetuation of kind of um, like colonial types colonial, of relationships. Yeah. 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 It, you know, I've described it as a form of systemic racism. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and, and the data speaks for itself. Less than 1% of charitable grants flow to indigenous organizations. Less than 1% of charitable grants flow to black organizations. Uh, when you talk about international development, Garnet, I know that's what you're particularly interested in. Uh, it is, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Uh, international development organizations in Canada must work with local charities overseas after all. How can they not do that unless mm -hmm. they have, you know, they're the Red Cross and they are, they, they are a mega empire. But let's say an organization, one of my, my favorites, Farm Radio International, which helps Kenyan farmers uh, uh, understand and learn about seeding, cropping, fertilizing, all of that. It has to work with uh, local journalists in Kenya because they broadcast their educational programs over the radio waves. Mm -hmm. Well, this little charity in Canada has to exercise direction and control over that radio 
outlet in Kenya, and it is viewed as a new, as a form of white saviorism, as mm-hmm. colonialism. You come in and you tell us what to do, and you you take control of our program. And this is not the way our international development principles work. But here's the irony of it: uh, an international development organization, in Canada. It must uh, abide by this law when it comes to charitable grants, but when it gets funding from the government of Canada, those same r- rules apply to government of Canada money because mm-hmm. they're a charity. And additionally, uh, no Canadian funds can be part of what you call pooled funds, you know, when you're trying to deal with uh, an issue, let's say in Nepal and Canada, US, Australia, the UK all come together and say, we'll all put our $10 into the pot so we can get a bigger bang for the buck. That makes sense. Canada cannot participate in that because it cannot exercise any control over Mm -hmm. the funds of the UK, US. And, And so it is a mess that needs to be sorted. I'll just give you an example. Because again, examples, you know, there's this, um, you know, Samaritans Purse Canada, which does uh, an educational program. It has um, in Nepal, small program, $300,000. It's not a lot of money for Canada, but it's a heck of a lot of money in Nepal. And in order to achieve its purposes, it has seven partners on the ground because Nepal is is complex and in its own way, we need to appreciate that. It needs to provide 22 different payments, 38 separate reports, and seven local organizations. And so the process and the paperwork is seven times as onerous. This is not a good use of charitable funds. Yeah. So so in, in raising these issues and concerns, is there anybody that thinks the current system is is working or or is it just like bureaucratic inertia and uh, distraction and, you know, maybe a lack of that issue of of a home in government for charities. Like, like, do you come up against people who say, actually, we need this because, or is it all just, you know, not enough awareness leading to leading to stasis? Well, I've been in parliament now long enough to understand one thing that risk aversion is baked into our public service. Hmm. So, they haven't done this before, they're, they're risk averse. Uh, they think the system works just fine uh, for them. Uh, and, you know, there are, there are questions about, well, if we open up this, this route of allowing charities to work with non-charities without direction and control, then there will be a loss of trust in charitable dollars because charitable dollars will flow to non-charitable activities. And, and all of that. Um, and I think all these questions can be addressed and have been addressed by my, my, my legislation. The accountability framework in my legislation is no less onerous than the, than the uh, former accountability framework, but it is more empowering. No mm-hmm. one is saying we're going to, you know, one of my colleagues in the sector has described it really well. Uh, she said that, um, Uh, In Canada, it's a red light to collaboration and partnership. We need an orange light, which is watch, look around and go. But an automatic red light is a stop to all kinds of, we're not asking for a green light, you know, that's also not on the books. It's a stop, look around, watch, do your due diligence, then go. Yeah, and I I guess the point you're making about risk aversion that that our, our public servants are, are are nervous about change right mm-hmm. um that um you're saying let's take this uh, quote-unquote accountability framework that isn't working and replace it with a different accountability framework uh, that, that works better and that's similar to what other countries have in, in the same situation um and that makes sense but it, it is a series of of hurdles then for those who are administering that framework they have to learn the new rules they have to figure out they you know and and they have to make sure that uh, what they're replacing it with um, also works uh, and works better and doesn't fix and doesn't create new problems or or have holes in it, right? So there is there is some risk associated with with change always. But uh, when we're talking about the kinds of of dollars saved for charities and addressing this issue of um, 
as, as you've called it, systemic racism, certainly colonialism, um, you know, that's, it's, it's worth taking that risk to try to bring about that change. But, um, but, but I guess this is, this is the, the work of the advocacy you're doing is to convince, convince people that they need to take that risk and make, make that sacrifice maybe. It's, a, it's, it's not as much of a risk as, as people think it is. It is a change in systems and procedures. And mm -hmm. I think uh, anyone inside the system knows that, that red flags go up. We've always done it this way. Why should we do it another right. way, et cetera, et cetera. I must say uh, that the CRA, which is the, administ the, you know, the enforcement arm, is, is very uh, uh, quick on these matters. But it can do nothing that is not in the act. And the act rests with finance, not with okay. the CRA. It's the finance that has to change the legislation. Yeah. And we're going to get to talking about the, the language and the budget around it, because this is sort of the, the most immediate catalyst. But before, before we get to talking about the budget, um, uh, I wonder if you can explain specifically the changes in your bill, Bill S-216, this is a bill that has passed the Senate twice now, um, and it's currently before the House of Commons, uh, sponsored by uh, by one of my colleagues, uh, MP Philip Lawrence, in the House of Commons. Uh, and um, so, so what what is this framework that this new bill would put in place? Okay, it has three changes, and it's a very large piece of legislation for a simple reason. First it replaces the reference in the Income Tax Act to activities carried out by the charity itself. It replaces them with charitable activities. So we're saying charities must use their dollars towards charitable activities. It takes out the own part of it. And because own activities is mentioned in the act 91 times, it has to be amended 91 times. So that's one mm -hmm. one. Next, it expands the definition of charitable activities and says charities can use their resources for charitable purposes by taking reasonable steps. And the reasonable steps go to ensuring accountability. And third, we lay out what these reasonable steps are, you know, before, before entering into an engagement with a non-qualified donee, uh, you have to do your due diligence, collect the information. Um, and, and there's a lot of legal talk about reasonable, and, and that's, a con that's a term uh, grounded in, in, in legal framework, so that there's a reason for that. And we lay out, you know, what reasonable steps are as without being over-prescriptive. Legislation should never, you know, put out every single item, but should leave it up to the guidance. So those are the three things the, the act does. And it, it also has a clause uh, that it, should, it will not come into force um, until two years after the legislation is passed, because you know it's a private bill. It's not a government uh, initiated bill. And so you need two years to do the to do the consultations and the guidance and, you know, developing all those things. And then finally, it says after five years, there has to be a review. So it's pretty mm -hmm. straightforward in, in that way. Yeah. So a lot of text, but it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, and that bill passed the Senate lightning fast in, in this parliament. It was yes. it was uh, um, it was sort of studied at the through the process in the last parliament and and um sadly a lot of these private members bills and we've seen this on many issues where um the process is so long and there's lots of delays that that uh it doesn't have time to make it through the process and especially with minority parliaments and and the covid recess but uh um but this bill passed uh right out of the gate in the senate before that before the house of commons and um and uh something that i i strongly support and have asked questions about um, the government put some language in the budget that is different from S216. Um, but is I think it's the first time anything from the government has acknowledged that there is a problem. So there's an acknowledgement of the problem. There's a commitment to fix it. Uh, but the budget talks about a different kind of a fix. So maybe if you can share what your reaction was to the budget and how what's being said in the budget maybe it's similar to, but also different from your work on S216. Yes. So first of all, I, I agree with you. Uh, this was uh, 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 
an acknowledgement, the budget, you know, finally acknowledged that there is an issue. And that is in and of itself a cause for some celebration. I am very, very pleased that the work of the sector and my bill um, and you and others has, has sort of lifted this conversation into legislative circles. It's pretty hard for a private bill to do that, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really pleased. Yeah. Uh, and when you read the language uh, in the budget, it says we will, uh, you know, uh, uh, reform or amend direction and control in the spirit of S216, which is the number of my bill. But when you read the fine print um, in, in the detailed part of the budget, it becomes at this point, at least, um, a little confusing to me as to what precisely the government will do, uh, because it does not mention amending the Income Tax Act and removing those two words, own activities, from it. And that is of some of great concern to me, uh, because that's like, you know, a car is not is 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 not working, and instead of fixing, instead of replacing the engine, you paint the car a new color. Hmm. It, it, it it fixes an expression of the problem, but it doesn't fix the problem itself. Now, I, I, I want to say that this is the beginning of the discussion we're having with finance and with other legislators. Uh, this will likely, the change will likely be in one of the two budget implementation acts. So there is time between now and then to inform and educate the government that this is, you know, this is a, a half-baked effort you're making, you must go the full stride and go right to the root of the problem, which is own activities, instead of further clarifying, or as they say, simplifying what direction and control is. It's If it, if it quacks like a duck and struts like a duck, I'm sorry, it's a duck. Mm -hmm. So to, to sharpen that, uh, that description. I think you've, you've you've done a good job of of identifying the issue and the and the uncertainty. Uh, you know, the two sixteen removes the reference to own activity. So charitable charities remain accountable for how they spend dollars in accordance with uh, charitable activities and charitable purpose, but uh, they're not required for to to. There's no requirement around them it being their own activities that are being funded. The budget talks about creating mechanisms to facilitate the transfer of money from uh, from uh, charities to non-charitable organizations. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's not a clear commitment to do away with direction and control. It's, it's just saying we're going to, we're going to try to find yeah. uh, some workarounds in some situations. Right. And, um, and, and uh, so, yeah, did I, did I capture that? Right. You captured that really well uh okay. it's 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 th there's always been a workaround this is a different workaround right it doesn't do away with the legal fiction that is created that you're still owning the activities it doesn't mm -hmm. get to the heart of the problem now right. you know i'm i'm an optimistic person they've mm -hmm. you know i i think i have some time with my uh, uh, stakeholder groups to educate and inform the government so that in fact, when this change is made, it is the full, full Monty that is required as opposed to you know, yet another explanation of what is direction and control and what you must do. It's, if, it, if you don't get rid of own activities, even if you clarify direction and control to a thousand percent, you are still exercising operational control over the mm -hmm. non-charity. Yeah, and, and, and that's really important, especially recognizing the sort of colonial and systemic racism dimension of this, right? Like if you're still, um, frankly, even if they could do away with all the administrative uh, burden pieces, uh, but leave in place that um, that structure defined as control, that would still be a huge problem for for that for that reason. Um, let's dig a bit more into this process issue of budget and budget implementation act because I think it's it's something we obviously deal with as legislators, but it's maybe not something that's that's widely recognized. So the the big news day is the budget because the budget is when the government says, "Here's this this book we published. These are the things we're going to do." Um, but that is that is sort of a a description of measures which the which parliament votes on and gives approval to in principle and then we have the budget implementation act that is the 
we have two budget implementation acts that implement the measures of the budget. Those actually, um, those actually change laws. And so the idea is that, that the, the ideas that are expressed in the budget are then worked out in the budget implementation act. I think there've been some cases in, in the past where something that was in the budget doesn't show up in the budget implementation acts. And there've been some cases, maybe vice versa, where something's been in the budget implementation act that wasn't foreshadowed in the, in the budget. So um, I'm getting the impression that, that you're saying, folks, now is the time to ramp up our advocacy efforts because before we see the budget implementation acts, this is, this is really what counts. It's, it's, it's the budget recognizes a problem um, and it could go a number of different ways. It's what's in the, what, what, what we, we call the BIA, Budget Implementation Act, that really counts. You're absolutely right. Uh, we've come, I would say, you know, some way, but we have to now go the full length. And, and depending on whether this legislation is in the first BIA or the second BIA, I'm actually thinking it will be in the second BIA simply because you know, uh, they need some time to figure this out, that we have, we have uh, some runway uh, to, um, to influence, educate, and raise awareness. There's also MP Philip Lawrence's bill, which is my bill, it's in the House of Commons, it's going to be debated in May. So the timing works perfectly, uh, mm -hmm. that this bill, as it, as in its spirit, as the budget says, will be debated in the House of Commons and it will go through its own process in the House of Commons and it may collide with the BIA or it may influence the BIA or, or you know, it could, the outcome could be one of many ways, but we have a window of opportunity. And I, 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 I hope uh, that uh, in the next six, seven months, we can raise the bar on awareness on, on why this is so important for the government to do. Yeah, it's a good point you make that this being in the budget doesn't change uh, the existence of S216 or its timeline. So no. if um, now if if the all of the same issues are fully addressed uh, by the Budget Implementation Act, uh, then it's it's always possible for the for the sponsor, in this case, Philip, to to, to, to it. Yeah, well, I yeah. I, and, and whether it's to withdraw it or you simply, you know, you, you, you recommend Let it die. Yeah. W w whatever the process that, but, um, but absent that, you know, the, the bill can still continue and it yeah. can still become law and it can, it can make further amendments. Um, it, you know, so, so, um, so, so this, it, this is the thing I'm, I, I, important to know as well, that it, that, that remains on, on the table, um, so, so, but we'll we'll see what's in the second second budget implementation act, right? I mean, that's that that's the that's the bottom line. That's the key, and I I think uh, we've got two horses in the race, so to say. Yeah. One is uh, Philip's uh, advocacy in the bill and and building off alliances throughout the House of Commons, as I was able to do, and yeah. it was in fact. Uh, it, it was hard because it's a technical bill and you have to take real pain to explain it to everybody. But it was also easy because almost not every senator sits on the board of a charity mm -hmm. and they all got it. They all got it. Hmm. And, and uh, there was nonpartisan support across the Senate to send it as quickly as possible uh, to the House of Commons. So we've got Philip in the race, we've got the opportunity to influence in the BIA. And so, you know, from my point of view, the glass is still half full. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been very encouraging to see how this, uh, how this issue has, has been able to progress. And, um, and, and again, I mean, the, the agenda setting power that comes from, you know, you being in the Senate and able to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm one out of, hundred something senators, you know, there's, there's another 338 MPs. Um, but we can at least put this on the agenda and force people to consider it and vote on it. And if it's a good idea, then, then it, um, then it can move forward. Uh, and, um, and it, I think it does speak to the earlier conversation we're having about the importance of the Senate where, um, without, um, without the Senate, we would be more dependent on, the bureaucracy for moving moving ideas forward, right? Uh, this the, you, you talked about kind of being inside government, but you're you're inside and outside at the same time, right? You're inside the legislative branch, but you're outside of the administration Public of government. Service, yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. true. That is true. You know, we've had some 
real successes with Senate bills. Uh, I, w- I recall Senator Andrzejczyk's bill with the Magnitsky law. Yes. I mean, it took four years for her yeah. to get that done. It was a, a long, hard ride. And, yeah. and, and look at where we are now, you know, how timely it is it that we have yes. that law. And it has not only been adopted by Canada, but by other jurisdictions as well. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, there is enormous uh, possibility for doing good work in the Senate and in the House of Commons as an individual parliamentarian outside of being, you know, as you are a member of caucus. Yeah. Um, One final question I wanted to ask about the charitable sector, and I think that this relates to direction and control as well. This is, I mean, one one of the big political stories of the last few years has been the We Charity scandal. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, I know that in some private conversations I had with people about the direction and control issue, um, you know, the, the real simple optics of um, you have uh, this scandal involving questions of, of accountability uh, at a charitable organization, a, a, a well-known charitable organization, and then you're talking about making changes to the, the accountability framework for, for charities. Um, I know I've heard from, heard from people who, who, who were concerned that you know, how would the We Charity scandal impact the perception of the charitable sector? Um, uh, I'm sort of on the side to think that, you know, the, 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 the We issues are, are, are about We, they're not about the charitable sector more broadly. And, the, um, you know, we, we did a lot of things that were very different from the way the charitable sector operates more broadly. But how, how do you, th- what is, has been the impact of the scandal, do you think, on, on public perceptions of the sector? And has it, has, it, uh, has it played into the direction and control debate at all? Well, it played enough into it that I decided to uh, postpone the tabling of the legislation until the scandal had died down. I was seriously worried that, in fact, issues of direction and control would be put into the context of the We Charity. And you're absolutely right. The issue of We Charity was We Specific. Uh, So I decided to postpone the tabling of the bill. And that that did set us back, you know, by six or seven months. I, I will say this. Uh, that the trust in the charitable sector did uh, uh, did suffer a bit, and then COVID happened. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they were they happened almost simultaneously. I remember, but uh, I think Canadians understood during and post the COVID crisis. If I may say, we're post the COVID crisis, we're likely not. But during the COVID crisis, they relied on the charitable sector more than that they had ever before. And that level of trust, again, uh, rose. Uh, so, you know, they relied on, on boys and girls clubs, they l- r- relied on the kids help fault line, they relied on shelters, they relied on food banks. And I think that sort of ameliorated the, the issue. I, what I do think is an issue in charities is the issue of governance. I think if the We Charity was emblematic of anything, it was uh, lax governance, in particular, the mixing of directors from one we entity into another. You know, we have to have guardrails around these issues. And I'm of the opinion that we shouldn't legislate these, that the sector should heal itself. You know, the the sector should be in charge and should put out best practices and norms and procedures and should grade itself. It should not come so far that the government has to legislate governance in the sector, at least not in this particular way. Uh, We need a a very clear line between organizations that are charities and that run a social enterprise. There needs to be guardrails and barriers because their objectives are different. And I think all that came to uh, ahead during the We Charity scandal. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is, yeah, th- this is an important distinction that, you know, so so a social enterprise is the idea of a, of a company with a defined social purpose, right? And that's different from a, from a charity, which is, which, because a, a social enterprise can still be, you know, for profit, right? Yes. Um, so, I mean, part of the issues around we that, that, uh, I mean, it was it was primarily the government's relationship with with we that that, that was a scandal. But I think part of the discourse as well was around this sense of, uh, yeah, this 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 governance issue. But just to play devil's advocate a little bit, like the you know you talk about the the, the charitable sector being able to to do this work itself. I mean, I think one of the issues from what I understand talking to people in the sector around we was that you have a a prominent organization um, 
that is in a sense separating itself from the rest of the sector, right? It's it's doing its own its own thing, right? Um, so so what are the mechanisms for if the charitable sector is going to work to establish best practices around accountability uh, for addressing the fact that there could be there could be outliers who don't follow that those best practices, but are but are really good at promoting themselves and at, at uh, you know getting their name out there. Um, how, What's, what's, uh, how the, can the I... sector has its own uh, institutes that uh, provide some kind of transparency and accountability. So right. charity intelligence, for instance, you know, it grades charities and, and you know, sort of gives the donor uh, uh, more information. And I think those kinds of uh, instruments may well have uh, a play. Uh, we was, was a serious disruptor. You know, I, I will say this, they embraced business models that were completely out of the box. And in a way, they were charting their own course in the wilderness, and then they fell on their own sword. Um, and le the lessons from that is uh, that best practices in governance, especially around co-mingling of, of boards and, you know, how many uh, individuals sit on so many boards? There is an issue here. I mean, we, we monitor it very carefully in the corporate sector, but not so much in the charitable sector. I mean, there mm -hmm. are other issues as well, you know, around governance. We ask every year, the corporate sector must disclose the demographics of its board every year. Mm -hmm. We don't ask that of charities. And then we complain that charities are not reaching out to BIPOC organizations. Well, of course not. Governance needs to change and renew itself. I you know, I think the government has a role in this, but it's it's a soft role, not a hard role. And I think the hard standard setting, monitoring, rewarding the the successes and the opposite of those who don't, that is the sector's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Well, Radna, thanks so much for, for taking the time. I think this has been a really, really good conversation. Um, I think people who who know and are connected to the sector will um, we'll really appreciate it. And, and for many Canadians who uh, interact with charities, I think most Canadians have some interaction with, with charity, whether it's, um, you know, attendance at their local house of worship or um, making, making donations at, at, at critical times. Um, uh, but to understand the kind of uh, um, the back office part of it, some of the, the governance debates and, uh, and the role that we can play as the legis legislators in, in trying to support the charitable sector, um, this is this is a really good conversation. I think hopefully a big takeaway for people uh, from this is that uh, a the charitable sector is important, and and b the government needs to uh, think about it and be engaged and supportive of it while while still respecting its distinctiveness without without uh, um, understanding the charitable sector is is its own thing and it needs to to have um, have a level of uh, of autonomy, of course, but uh, that the government can can play a supportive role if it has a, a greater level of attention understanding uh, to it. So um, I'll leave the last word to you if you want to comment on anything um, on anything I've said or, or any follow up comments on the Senate on direction and control on charities. Um, thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Garnet, so much for having me. I, I the comment I will make is that the House of Commons and the Senate are their own two satellites. And it is important for them to connect. So thank you for so much for giving me this opportunity to connect across our aisle, so to say, because you know legislation uh, is not just the purview of one house or the other, but both. And it's a it's a delight to have been on this conversation with you. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. We, we're out every uh, every week now with these episodes, and uh, uh, please uh, please share this on social media. Uh, follow if, if you're just seeing this episode and you haven't been following me before you can you can find resuming debate on uh, any of your podcast platforms uh, we have these these good long-form conversations on a broad range of issues and please uh, leave a review uh, um, help us to reach more people that way thanks so much and we'll we'll be back again with another episode in seven days Thank you.